Hello! Rick here with a video that went on a little longer than I planned. What happened to the crew of the USS Voyager when they returned to the Alpha Quadrant? Voyager had become something of a celebrity vessel within and without Starfleet when it was learned to have survived its vanishing. This reputation only grew as the vessel came closer to home. Upon returning in the early months of 2378, it had to become one of Starfleet's most famous vessels, earning a legacy registry that would be passed down alongside the Enterprises. So first up, let's take a look at some general events that covered all of the crew before looking at some specifics. Sources on this include canon and apocryphal materials, so bear that in mind. The former Marquis crew were excused for their actions and allowed to officialise their commissions in return for their service on the Intrepid Vessel. Most of the crew, in fact, were offered promotions if they remained in Starfleet for several reasons. Firstly, they'd earned it, and many were now privy to experiences, technology and information that most in Starfleet would never experience, making them valuable members that the fleet did not want to lose. The other reason was quite simply morale. Voyager's miraculous return was one of the few high points for Starfleet coming just after the Dominion War, and keeping these exemplary officers would serve to bolster morale. In fact, we learn from Lower Decks that not only were the crew considered celebrities, commemorative memorabilia was commissioned, presumably outside of Starfleet control, but only total dweebs collected all the plates, for example. And finally, when it came to posting and opportunities, Voyager crew were practically inundated with offers. The ship itself was a collection of Delta Quadrant discoveries and a commodity in its own right. It spent a good few months in the hands of Starfleet Research and Development who analysed its databases of Delta Quadrant scans and removed most of the technologies that the crew had added. Some tech, such as the Quantum Slipstream Drive and Delta Flyer, were quickly reverse engineered and divisions appointed to replicate these devices. However, some other tech, such as the Ablative Armor and Advanced Anti-Borg Weapons, were quarantined for the sake of the Temporal Prime Directive. This is understandable, as these were brought back via time travel anyway, while the Slipstream Drive and many of Seven's Borg modifications were current era developments. Before the Trek timeline began to crawl forwards again with new shows, the novelizations were the primary source of lore concerning the fates of many of the crew. However, the continuity presented in these is gradually being overwritten by the shows as they move onwards, such as the Project Full Circle fleet, which saw Starfleet return to the Delta Quadrant. Nevertheless, we can look into the canon material first before exploring some potential options derived from other media, starting with the captain who got them home. Catherine Janeway. We know for certain that almost immediately she accepted a promotion to Vice Admiral, and her experiences in the Delta Quadrant were used to flesh out the advisory hologram program designed to instruct crews in how to operate in the far-flung region. The book series paints her as an operational expert on dealing with the Borg, and a good portion of her duties had her assigned to related topics of defence and research. These events culminated in a Borg invasion in 2381 and her eventual assimilation and death. She was then resurrected by Q Jr, Lady Q and Kefs, and things get really off the rails, divulging into the Star Trek Destiny timeline. One thing I would like to see from the books, however, is that Janeway and Chakotay actually get together, which I ship wholeheartedly. Speaking of... Captain Chakotay takes over command of the USS Voyager. His first few missions were under careful scrutiny from Starfleet Command, who despite his pardon as a former Marquis leader, were wary of placing such a man in command of a vessel. Nevertheless, he proved himself loyal to Starfleet, and after initially being denied his own pick of XO, got to recruit Tom Paris. His missions are covered in the Voyager pocketbook relaunch novels, where he remains in the command chair for most of them, until at least 2381. Spoilers for Star Trek Prodigy now in the next few seconds, but he was evidently given command of the experimental USS Protostar canonically at some point, not too long after this on its mission to the Delta Quadrant. However, there must also be time travel shenanigans afoot, as the Protostar had spent 17 years crashed and abandoned in 2383, well before it could have been developed in the first place. But that's for a separate video when I know more. Suffice to say, in both continuities, he remains in Starfleet and takes on the role of a starship captain. Now, Tom Paris actually turns up in canon, briefly performing handshake tours to the fleet, meeting with other crews to discuss his time aboard Voyager, but aside from that, we don't know much. 
His daughter, Mirelle Paris, was born in 2378, so for the first few years he'd have his hands full with parenthood, and presumably is still with Balana. This confirms the fame that the crew had earned during their tenure, and how they were generally perceived by the rest of the fleet. Later in the books he was also assigned to continue his position aboard the Voyager, and eventually promoted to Lieutenant Commander and First Officer in 2379. However, when we see him in Lower Decks, he's still a lieutenant. By the 25th century, he is a captain of the USS Mercury, the prototype for its class, and a ship built for speed and impulse manoeuvrability. By this time, Miral Paris also works aboard the vessel, and has concerns that Tom requested her due to the familial connection. He ends up in command of a wing of ships that is made from similarly unruly and undisciplined individuals called Delta Flight, who undertake high stakes missions with unorthodox tactics. Sounds like he basically gets to live out his Captain Proton fantasies then. Belana Torres also remains in Starfleet, taking a promotion to Lieutenant Commander, however she takes leave for some time to focus on family and work through some stuff concerning Miral Paris' position as the Kuvin Ma. This whole issue really interferes with her plans, to put it mildly, as her daughter was kidnapped and threatened by other cults, and it seems this pretty much became the focus of her life for a time. It pretty much wasn't until 2382 that she was able to really focus back on her own career and goals, with her and Tom taking assignments that would keep them close to home after all the upheaval they had experienced. Duvok's first thing was to get his neural disorder fixed by his family before he took a new teaching position at Starfleet Academy in order to stay close to them. In 2379 he was assigned to an undercover mission to Romulus to extract Ambassador Spock, but the Shinzon government uncovered him and held him prisoner. He was rescued by the USS Titan and eventually accepted Riker's offer to remain aboard, becoming its tactical officer. Now, we never see Tuvok aboard the Titan in Lower Decks, so whether or not they'll add this to the canon is still up in the air, but I'd love to see it. Eventually, however, he is promoted up the chain until he reaches the rank of Rear Admiral by 2409, and he picks the aging USS Voyager as his flagship, which by that stage is 38 years old. This wouldn't be as weird as it sounds, considering Starfleet kept their ships in operation for decades, and most flag officers only take older vessels to save the newer ships for where they're needed. He was assigned to head up missions concerning Species 8472, as well as playing the role of a key mediator in an alliance between the Alpha Quadrant powers when the Delta Quadrant was opened up for exploration. Considering he is a Vulcan, while many careers would have been winding down in the 25th century, his was still going strong. As for the EMH Doctor, many stories have him pioneering for holographic rights. His efforts caused the UFP to rewrite and update its laws concerning the rights of artificial lifeforms, and in 2380 he was declared a person. He worked as part of a Federation think tank research team alongside Zimmerman, Barclay, and possibly Seven of Nine, depending on current canon. In 2382, Starfleet attempted to possess his emitter to replicate its tech, but he filed a lawsuit and was allowed to keep it, despite its significance to Starfleet. He did, however, cooperate with its analysis. In 2395, he accepted an official Starfleet commission at the rank of Lieutenant Commander and was assigned to research on Gaylor 4. So, now with official rank and status within Starfleet by 2410, he was even part of the Starfleet exploratory arm in the Delta Quadrant, where he lent his expansive knowledge. Harry Kim remained an ensign until the ripe old age of 81, when he was sent back to the academy and became the fleet's oldest cadet. In reality, he too was fast promoted to a full lieutenant, skipping the junior grade, and he stays on Voyager for a time under Captain Chakotay. He served as security and tactical chief, but his relationship with Libby Webber did not work out. By 2400 he was promoted to commander and the head of security on Starbase 11, before becoming the eventual captain of the USS Rhode Island a decade later. This is Star Trek Online continuity, which sort of mirrors the alternate future we saw in Endgame. He serves as the Starfleet representative to the Kabali, when Starfleet eventually returns to the Delta Quadrant 2. Seven of Nine's future is a bit easier to decipher considering her place in Star Trek Picard, but this does mean that her tale is ongoing. We are missing what she got up to immediately after Voyager, but considering her place in Picard, as well as in beta content, it looks like she does not suddenly join Starfleet. 
she may have operated as an advisor to them in an anti-Borg capacity, as well as being assigned as a consultant, her knowledge a valuable asset, but she never joined the organisation. In the books and the shows, her relationship with Chakotay doesn't seem to pan out, which I'm fine with because that frees him up for Janeway. Eventually, prior to 2386, she joins an organisation called the Fenris Rangers, which was technically a vigilante group, but operated from Fenris, flying around the nearby sectors, helping out where needed. In 2386, Icheb is killed and butchered by Bejazel, more on him in a minute. The destabilisation of the neutral zone and Romulan losses taxed the group to its extremes, but this was the group she was still with by 2399. Now she remains with the crew of the Last Sirena. So, Icheb, killed off in 2386 by Bejazel at seven domes in the Hypatia system. Before that, however, he had enrolled in Starfleet Academy with the recommendation of Janeway and studies dating back to 2377 when he was preparing for application while on Voyager. By 2382, he was an ensign and worked alongside Balana Torres when she was able to work, and in 2385 he was officially adopted by Seven of Nine according to some stories, and by 2386 he had been promoted to Lieutenant and was the science officer of the USS Coleman. His death causes Seven to embark upon a path of revenge, but it ends the promising career of an exceptionally talented individual. As for Naomi Wildman, she too enters Starfleet and graduates around 2392 in one continuity or 2385 in others. 92 seems more likely, even with her accelerated aging. Her early assignments saw her as the helm officer aboard the USS Hathaway before becoming a lieutenant commander in 2401 and taking the role of second officer. The speed of promotion shows a great promise in her career, and by 2409 she was a commander in rank and the CO of Station Deep Space K7. Finally, Neelix. Well, his status as de facto Delta Quadrant Ambassador was officialised, where he helps Talaxian colonies in the area and does a lot to establish trade routes around his home station. He remains with Dexa, and in every storyline that revisits the Delta Quadrant, books or games, he is the first point of contact for the Federation in establishing a stronger foothold in the region, otherwise remaining in contact with the Federation through the Midas Array. I originally looked into more crew members, but this video was getting way too long for that. But Vorik ends up on Utopia Planitia. Thanks for watching this look at what the crew got up to post-Voyager, drawn primarily from the novel universe, but with what we know from canon up front. I've been Rick, and until the next video, thanks again, and goodbye.